Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Fernanda Viegas. I'm part of Google Brain. I'm also a leader in the PEAR initiative, which stands for People Plus AI Research. Um, and I'm very excited to be joined today by this wonderful panel. So here to my side is Rajan Sheth. He's Director of Product Management at Google Cloud AI. Daphne Luong, Engineering Director at Google. And John Platt, Director of Applied Science in Google AI. And today, we're going to talk about opportunities, challenges, and strategies to develop AI for everyone. So if you could, please, I would love for each one of you just to talk very briefly about what do you do at Google? Um, uh, so my name is Rajan Sheth, and I, I run the product team for Cloud AI. And so what we're doing is uh, within Google Cloud, we're trying to figure out how can we bring the best of AI to developers and to, and, and to enterprises. And so um, how do we give, uh, give developers a great platform to build on, but then how do we take some of the best of Google's AI and make it so that they're available as services for, uh, uh, for developers? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Daphne Long. I work in Google AI, human computation, data, and natural language understanding. I'm John Platt, and I... Uh, um, help run the Applied Science Org inside of Google AI. Uh, we're super excited about all the opportunities in uh, uh, science related to things like biology or physics, and we believe that computer science, especially machine learning and AI, can really help accelerate that. So that's what, that's what my org does. Thank you. So one of the things that is very inspiring to me uh, about this panel and about a lot of the themes going on at I.O. this year is AI for everyone. And so I know that in PEAR, one of, the, one of the main research themes we have is how do you design human-centered AI technology? How do you start with the user in mind and then design machine learning technology that fits with that? So one of the things I'd love to ask each one of you to, to talk about a little bit is what does AI for everyone mean to you? So I, for me, it means really how do you make AI easy and useful uh, for, for, for people that want to use it? And I think there are two big problems that we're seeing right now uh, with AI. One is that there, there isn't as much skill out there or as much knowledge about how to build uh, AI models, especially deep learning, as, uh, as there should be. Um, and so we're trying to both build tools for that and to, to, to make it so that uh, more people can access AI, uh, but, then, uh, but, but then also can also learn about, uh, uh, learn about AI and, and, uh, and figure out how to use that. What we're finding, for example, is that you know, there are probably in the tens of thousands of people out there that know how to use deep learning, probably in the order of a couple of million of data, data scientists out there, but there are 21 million developers. And so our goal is how do we get AI to be accessible by the 21 million developers. And the second part of that is usefulness. How do we actually make it so that AI is useful? Um, the, how do we go, especially for businesses, beyond kind of um, wh where they can not only do cool things, but they can do things that are useful that actually are vital to their business? Great. Daphne. To me, um, getting everyone involved and aware so that algorithms have representation for all of our users, right? So on the data side, this means that we need to have the data that's re representative of all our users. Yeah, well, for me, AI for everyone is trying to get the benefits of AI to uh, a, a large part of society or across the world. So what we do is we look for leverage points, right? We're not trying to get everyone in the world to use AI. We're trying to get them to have the fruits of sort of what AI can provide. So if we can find these leverage points which, um, where a, a local application of AI can really help the whole world, that's what we're looking for. That's why I'm super excited about applying AI and machine learning to problems in science, because you know, science can lead to breakthrough technologies. Great. I think one of the, the interesting things here for this panel and this theme is that each one of you is coming from a very different perspective, right? So Rajan, I, I think about you as coming from the product slash business side of things. Daphne, you're, you're helping build some of the fundamental blocks, like the data, the fundamental data creation blocks for 
being able to do this technology at all. And then John, you're coming from a research perspective, right? How do we enable scientists? How do we enable science at large? Um, so one of the things that comes up uh, whenever we talk about AI, whenever we talk about machine learning, is this notion of um, representation. And I want to start at the beginning with that. I want to talk about data. And so, Daphne, I was really excited when I heard that you were going to be part of this panel, because I think about you as the data czar of Google. <laughs> and so you, your work is a lot about creating better ways um, to scale up, for instance, how do we gather data? How do we do it in, in an insightful way? And so one of the things I'd love for you to talk about a little bit is the, the representation of data sets at Google. Um, what, is, what does that look like today? Yeah. So having semantically meaningful and systematic, like correctly calibrated label data at scale is really crucial for machine learning. Right? And from a representation perspective, um, some of the data set out there are not you know, well balanced. Uh, for example, if you look at Wikipedia data, right, he, the pronouns he, is mentioned so much more than she. Right? So um, inside Google, we have a lot of data. Um, an example set that I, um, that I want to talk about is the audio data set that we open sourced last year. Um, the data sets had 2.1 million uh, video with 8.5 um, K hour of, of audio, but then we annotated with around 500 classes of sound. Um, that's really interesting, right? Like you have sounds from like speech and music all the way to like uh, engine sounds or burping, right, or gargling. So then from that perspective, it's really important to have um, audio and sounds from all over the world, right? Like having sounds from kids from India is very different from China and the US. So that kind of thing is what I think you know, we should think about whenever we make data sets. So that's wonderful. When, when, yeah, when, when I became aware of all the different open, open source data sets that we have put out, I, I was really it's really exciting to see audio, video, text. You have translation. You have, you have all of those. But whenever you're talking about data in machine learning, you're also talking about challenges, right? So one of the things you kind of started touching on a little bit, and I want to pull that out more, is this notion of representation, um, making sure that the data set has um, good representation from different users, different communities. And that's a hard thing to do. So I'm curious, what are we at Google doing about that? How are you thinking about that? Yeah. So um, you know, Google users and communities, right? They have been very generous, um, donating data and stuff for us to make our, our product better. An example is Google Guy. How many of you use a Google Guy in the audience, right? So yes. So on the data front, we are also doing something really similar. Uh, we have a crowdsource app, which is an app and on the web. Um, right now, since the last two years, we actually have 2 million users donating to the app uh, from all over the world, actually 233 countries. That's a lot of different people, right? And we have 200 million donations from people answering questions all the way from, hey, can you see this sign from the street for, um, in an Indonesia city versus, hey, how do you, is this sentence, what's the sentiment of this sentence uh, in Hindi? Right? So there's all those data, and those data actually help us um, make product better, um, help people navigate street where there's no sign, right? from like um, landmark navigation, um, make, making the keyboard more accessible, uh, as well as um, making, you know, um, having more detailed label data set. So I think that's really important. Um, if you don't have the crowdsource app, please download it. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I, one of the things about audio that uh, I had never thought about until I read this is that there's a huge discrepancy between even voices of adults versus children and children. It's, it's, so you have to think about many, many different dimensions That's of right. diversity, right? Yeah. And then from, from the app, we actually have like uh, user, um, user con um, in initiated um, groups that's in 35 countries. So we're actually really excited about the whole contributions. Awesome. OK. So now, moving on a little bit about from data, one of, one of the things, whenever we talk about AI for everyone, 
one of the, I think, first questions that comes to mind is how do we make AI accessible and better for our users? And Rajan, here I'm going to turn to you. And um, since you, you are helping lead these services on cloud, right? How do you think about designing these ML tools so that, so that they are easy for users to use? Yeah. And, and then a segue question there, too. If you could talk a little bit about what are the difficulties that you're starting to see? What are the patterns that where students get, um, users get stuck? Yeah, yeah, great question. And I think there are two, uh, two big parts of that. One is how do we make it easy for people to create models? But then the second part is how do we make sure that those models are fair, are not biased, are, are, are really kind of serving the purpose in the right way? Because it is very easy for people to just take what they've been doing manually and end up encoding bias into, uh, into a model. So on one part of it, what we're doing is we're providing a, a variety of tools. One of the most interesting things that we're working on uh, is Cloud AutoML. And so Cloud AutoML is a way by which uh, you can give us a data, site, a data set, and then we'll use machine learning to create a machine learning model for that data set. Um, we're, uh, the first area we're doing uh, this with is uh, image recognition, where you can give us a set of images that are labeled, and then we'll give you a highly accurate model uh, on top of that to, to predict. Uh, for, for images. And so um, that has really helped this expand. We have you know, 15,000 people that have signed up uh, for access to that. And we're seeing amazing use cases, everything from really large companies to very small companies who are doing things around, you know, for example, helping farmers manage their field or helping track litter uh, and, and making sure to track litter back to, to the producers. How, how much uh, technical expertise do I as a user need to have if I want to use AutoML? Yeah, great question. We're, we're trying to orient it to make it so that you, you need to have limited or no ML expertise to be able to use it. And, and if you look at our UI, it's very similar to, say, Google Photos. You, you upload your pictures. You label them. You can, uh, we actually are, are integrating with a, a lot of the services that Daphne and team are using to have us label it if you want that. Mm -hmm. And then you just hit train, and then we'll create a model for you. However, that said, getting the right data set is the key part there. So even if you don't have to go create the model, you have to create the right data set. And so there, we're trying to provide tools to make sure that uh, people are, are able to create the right data set and figure out where there are flaws in the data set. And then on the other side of this, around things like bias, um, we're trying to figure out tools around that and also help advise customers with, with best practices uh, to make sure that the data set they're putting in um, can actually produce uh, the right results. OK. And so data continues to be one of those bottlenecks, yeah. right? Data is the foundation of this. And if you put in the wrong data, you end up with the wrong results. Yeah. OK. Um, John, one of, one of the themes, as you all have been seeing, is diversity. Diversity in data sets. Uh, also, how do you create these experiences for users who are not themselves machine learning experts to be able to use this technology? I'm also curious to hear from you about diversity and representation um, on the side of machine learning developers and researchers. The reason I'm looking at you is because you're working with scientists. Mm -hmm. And so these are people who are going to be um, potentially needing custom models. They're going to be pushing the envelope envelope sometimes, uh, but they may not themselves be machine learning experts. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts there. Right. Well, science is getting to be increasingly data-driven. Uh, a lot of scientists, like from physicists to geologists to biologists, uh, they do their job by gathering large amounts of data. So they're already kind of getting into data science. And so there's a big opportunity right now for them to use machine learning to kind of make themselves be much more productive. Um, the way I look at it is it's kind of like giving a scientist thousands of undergraduate assistants. In other words, something <laughs> to look at, you know, slides. If you, if you, if you could examine, you know, slides of cells, you could just have thousands of assistants uh, look at it for you. So that's sort of one example. So I'm, I'm really, I don't know if this answers your question, but I'm really excited that we, we can build kind of models to help scientists do specific things to help accelerate their, their research. And, and we, we actually collaborate with scientists uh, to help build these kind of models. So I don't know if that answered your question. And, and 
what kinds of scientists are you working with right oh, now? Oh, uh, well, uh, the applied science people, there's a bunch of us working with biomedical research, uh, trying to understand uh, the, the, the core research of disease, like uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, there's a bunch of us working on climate and energy, so we're working with a company called TAE Technologies, uh, trying to figure out whether we can make fusion energy, make it uh, commercially relevant. So we, we span across biology, physics, chemistry. We work with a bunch of people who simulate quantum chemistry. Uh, and, and I guess the same question I, I asked Rajan, I, I'd like to ask you, which is what do you see as the biggest difficulties for scientists to do this kind of work today? Are, are there... Are there kind of patterns? Is it data? Is it understanding how to put together models? Is it, what, what do you see? Well, they generally don't want to build models themselves, although some of them do. There's an increasing crossover between scientists and, and computer scientists. But I think they would prefer to have um, a, a productivity tool. In other words, could they get a, a get, can we help them build a productivity tool for their own research? Yeah. And, um, Either they could try to build it themselves if they know machine learning, or we can help them. Okay. So one of, along those lines, one of the things that I've been very excited about is um, a, a few months ago, um, folks in, in Pair, um, in collaboration with others at Google, launched TensorFlow.js. And this is really significant in the sense that we, what we were talking about in, in terms of democratizing the technology and bringing it, bringing machine learning to the web, right? TensorFlow.js speaks the native language of the web, speaks JavaScript. And so now you have a whole new set of, of uh, developers who can start to take advantage of, of this technology. And we are already starting to see some interesting applications. Uh, for instance, um, one developer who decided to create, uh, to train a model based on his web camera to make the mouse move in different directions just by where he was looking. So if he looked up, the mouse would go up. If he looked down, the mouse would go down. And the reason he did that was because he was trying to help a friend who had suffered a stroke and became uh, paraplegic. So that, to me, again, starts to talk about this possibility of bringing this technology into your, into your personal What do you need? How can you train these models how, for, for your specific uh, purposes? So one thing I, I think as we talk about democratizing the technology, as we talk about bringing it to everybody, one of the things that I think we at Google um, are very mindful of is that we, we have to do that with insight and responsibility, right? You, you want to be thinking ahead. So um, one question I have, Rajan, is, is uh, since you are providing this service, right? Um, what happens if you have bad actors trying to use your service, mm -hmm. and what safeguards uh, could you provide? Yeah, the, the, that's a great question. It's something that is very much top of mind uh, for us, because as we see more people use AI, we want to make sure that we're providing those safeguards, whether it's kind of safeguards or or best practices to make sure uh, that, that it's used in the right way. On one hand, um, when you have things like open source technologies, it's very hard to prevent people from, from doing bad things if they want to do bad things. But one advantage we have with cloud is that we, we can. We can put in terms of services or uh, acceptable use policies, things like that, uh, to make sure people are using this in, uh, in the right way. And I think one thing we're discovering with, uh, with uh, AI is that we have to rethink that. It's, it's not an infrastructure technology anymore. We have to rethink the, the, the uses. And that's something that, uh, uh, that, that, that we're doing quite a bit. Another thing that worries me, too, is um, beyond just bad actors, uh, people unintentionally doing uh, things that, that might be bad and not even knowing that they are. And it goes back to some of the things we talked about with bias and fairness. Uh -huh. um, in a lot of cases, people aren't intending to create something that's biased, but they end up creating something that's biased because, they, because of the data that's coming in. And so that's another area that we're looking at quite a bit, which is how do we help 
people out there, our customers, developers, um, have the tools to be able to do this well, uh, such that uh, such that they're not unintentionally creating bad models too. Right. Yeah. So, like alongside of uh, tooling, right? I think it's also important to like get people trained all the way from the beginning end to end. Like really mindful of the data. Uh, diversity, what you need for data. We actually train like even annotator, right? So they are aware, having diversity along the you know the whole path. Uh, so I think that's important. And then under, uh, for other practitioners to understand about um, best data, best practices for yeah. machine learning. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I usually think about this from the research perspective because I'm a researcher and we write and publish papers and. We have to think very carefully about when we write a paper. I mean, the intent is to have a positive impact on the world, right? So before we, we uh, you know, release the paper, we say, is this going to have a positive impact on the world or, or not? Now, you can't always predict, you know, there's going to be unintended consequences of releasing a technology. Um, but we try to, you know, do the best we can. And we generally have a bias towards openness um, uh, because it's just generally we have a uh, the prior is that it's, it's better to share these technologies. Yeah, I have to say, as a researcher myself, I've, I, I love the ethos of just publishing and, and open sourcing. And I have never been in a field like this before, where you, the whole idea is you publish as soon as you have uh, a finding, and then you submit to a conference like that. I had never seen that before. And I think it's wonderful because it, it means that the field progresses much faster, right? Um, I want to come back to, to one point that we were talking about, which is this notion of there might be unintended consequences or even with the best of intentions, you may not know that your, your data is biased or that there might be a skew or something. And there, one, one, um, one thought I'd, I'd love to put out is this notion that um, building tools so that people can inspect the data um, and also opening up the community of people who inspect these things. So in Pair, for instance, one of the things we've been doing is building tools, visualization tools that visualize your entire data set and allows, allow you to very easily see things like, oh, this is the shape of my data. This is the distribution. This is what female data points look like, or male data points, or children data points. And what this means is that because it's, because it's this kind of user interface where the experience is a visualization. It means that not only developers can look at this. It means that product managers can look at this, executives, um, whoever, different stakeholders can start having a conversation, sit together and be like, oh, I, I don't know, I saw something strange in the data set. Or what do you think is going to happen when we facet by this dimension here? And so I'd love to hear a little bit of your thoughts on, on um, the importance of broadening the conversation around doing AI for everyone so that it's not a conversation that is happening only amongst developers. Obviously, the developers are super important. But I also think it's a conversation that needs to happen with a broader set of stakeholders. I guess one, one thought on that, and uh, it, it's interesting you kind of, in the previous co uh, conversation, you were talking about how, how rapidly this is, this is going. One, one way I usually start out my presentations to customers is the first slide I show a picture of uh, the Mosaic browser from 1994. And my point with it is that we, all of us, you know, we remember back to what that was. And uh, before that point, the internet had been around for a very long time before that point. But that was when the internet started to go out to many more people for many more things. You started to see everything from checking sports scores all the way through to e-commerce, all kinds of things. And it opened up many more possibilities and opened up a lot more questions. Yes. And also questions where there needed to be more tools, tools to make it easier, but tools to make people safe. And I think we are at 1994. We are at, the, at that point for AI right now. It's been used for years and years and years, but now it's being used in many, many more ways. And so I think we need to think about tooling in that way. We need, new problems are starting to come up every single day. And 
new technologies are coming out every single day. And so we're going to need to think about that not just as a developer community, but then in coordination with how it's being used and the people that it's affecting. Right. Uh, we, we were, Rajan and I were just talking about the first spam detector before we came up in 1997. And that really, you know, I remember the first spam email that got sent in the, in the 80s. In, in, uh, and so it, it's as, as new problems come up, you need to have sort of new tools to kind of help fight the, the problem, so. That's a good yeah. point, but for a long time you didn't need a spam detector. Right. And yeah. then all of a sudden you did, and then you had to have tools to be able to, to work with it. Another thing, uh, another aspect of this, of broadening the conversation, um, especially when we're talking about products also, is this notion of having in the same room your technical team, your design team, for instance, and your, pro your PMs and so forth. And so one of the things we're doing at Google is finding ways of, of involving uh, the designers, the UXers, from the beginning and, and educating them around machine learning as, as a design material. How do you think about that as, as literally a material you're going to design with? And if you think about it, it's a very challenging material because it's something that each person in a product might have a slightly different user experience. My experience might be very different from yours. Certain things might be automated in different ways for different people at different times. And so it makes the UX, the user interaction, much more challenging. That space becomes a lot bigger. Um, and so again, when we are talking about AI for everyone, it really means this conversation that needs to happen between multiple, multiple parties. Um, one thing I have to come back to before we run out of time, John, is, uh, is this notion of science. Um, one of the things that I think there's a lot of excitement around is that machine learning could be a new paradigm for scientists, right? That finally we could solve certain very complex scientific problems using these new tools. So I'm curious about your thoughts as uh, why is it that AI makes such a difference in these very complex spaces? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, right now, the current state of AI and machine learning um, is uh, it's still very perceptual. We're very, very good at looking at images, listening to sounds. And so you can imagine, as I said before, I like to talk about these thousands of undergraduates. They would be listening or looking at the data. And so that's a great productivity term for science. In the long run, uh, we, people are starting to do research into this, but uh, in the long run, uh, what we really want is something called causal models, where, where the machine learning or AI algorithm actually tries to understand what caused what. We don't, I mean, that's still very, very early in, in research, but that's almost the essence of science. A, a scientific model explains, you know, this caused that, and you can extrapolate if you know what the causal model is. So I think that's sort of the long-term uh, trend for AI, but we're not there yet because we don't, our, our models don't really understand causation yet. So one of the things along those lines, we had a visiting scientist in our group in Cambridge. Uh, he's an earthquake uh, science. You know who I'm talking about. He's a professor at Harvard who came and spent uh, half a year with us. And one of the things I thought was incredibly inspiring about what he was doing. So obviously, as an earthquake scientist, you want to predict earthquakes, right? It's incredibly hard. We can't do it well yet. But the thing that he was able to do, so I did not know anything about earthquake science. He explained to me that this is the kind of science that lives in um, HPC, high performance computing. So huge, huge computers that will spend like entire weeks doing very, very gnarly computation, trying to simulate where might a aftershock happen after an earthquake, okay? Things that Californians should care a lot about, and, and I'm sure you do. So um, imagine something that takes a week running on huge computers, okay? He was able to get 
uh, these kinds of simulation results that were just as good using a simple neural net. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was so simple. The neural net was so simple that it was the kind of neural net where you could count the neurons. That's how how simple it was. And so he, one, he was stunned and incredibly happy because it meant he didn't need to wait, wait a, a whole week and using a ton of compute power to do the same kind of simulations he was doing. But then. So that in itself was a win. But then the deeper question, and one of the things that gives me a lot of excitement, is what exactly was this neural net figuring out about the physics of the Earth that we haven't figured out yet? So, and again, if we could interpret what this system was doing, what this neural net was doing, if we could learn from it, could we become better scientists ourselves? Right? And you're starting to see this in science. You're starting to see this in medicine. So for instance, the, the brain work with uh, diabetic retinopathy, where uh, these systems are looking at the image of the back of your eye, your fundus. And not only are they being able to um, understand whether or not uh, you have um, uh, the diabetic retinopathy, but uh, they are also being able to do things like understand the gender of the patients and the cardiovascular risk of cardiovascular disease, disease risk. Things that doctors themselves couldn't necessarily see in these images. So again, part of the race now is to understand what are these systems learning that we couldn't learn. So can we become better doctors, better scientists, right? Um, by using this kind of, can we learn back? Can we listen back from, from these machines? So we have a few minutes to go, but I, I, I have two more questions. One is for you, Rajan. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing of the ability of AI to really help businesses? Have, I guess I'm curious about like, what have been some of the most successful cases, but also some of the most surprising. And you're like, whoa, I didn't know we could do AI for this. Or, yeah. Yeah, there, there are a bunch of things that, that, that we've seen. There are definitely um, certain industries that, that are farther ahead. Tech industry, of course, there's, there's a lot being used there. Financial services, there's a lot already being used. But then there are many emerging use cases which I think are pretty amazing. Um, some, of the, some of the examples we see, like on the manufacturing line, can you use vision to figure out if a part is okay or not. Like if a tire coming down the factory line is going to be a good tire or it might actually bear risk to, to the person. Those kinds of things are things that, uh, uh, that we're starting to see. Retail is another case. How do you actually make it so that you can um, uh, make the experience of the, of the user better? So I'll give you an example. We, we were using AutoML with Disney. Um, my son happens to be a massive Lightning McQueen fan uh, from Cars. Um, and I'm sure many of you have, have kids or family members that are, that are big Disney fans. He will be, he has an insatiable appetite for Disney stuff um, and stuff with Lightning McQueen. Now, with the technology that we've developed, you can search on Disney's, uh, uh, on Shop Disney for everything with Lightning McQueen on it, whether or not it says it in the description or not. It'll do it by visual inspection. Those kinds of things are really uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, use cases. And so we're starting to see that. One of the things I think that is important, though, is that we need to get uh, businesses to the point where they're not thinking about, hey, I'm using AI to do this, but where the users are feeling magic. And it doesn't matter if it's AI behind the covers or not. And that's where I think things like what we've done with Google Photos and stuff like that is really incredible, because it's not about AI. It's about the user experience. That's awesome. So um, we, talked, we talked about some of the challenges, uh, some of the strategies. I want to end on the opportunities. We talked about some of the opportunities also, but I want to I end on that note, on the opportunities. In the last year, we've seen AI uh, being applied to, to various domains in really interesting ways. So you have medicine science. You have farming, right? We were talking about some of those examples. And I'd love to hear from each one of you, what opportunity are you excited about for, for the next however many years? 
John, do you want to start? Okay. <laughs> well, you mentioned uh, biomedical research. So no, I can't talk about that. So uh, let me talk about another project I find really exciting, which I mentioned before, which is we're actually working to see if we can get um, a fusion energy to be a real commercial source of energy in order to displace fossil fuels, because right now the world is burning way too many fossil fuels and flooding the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. So we're actually using machine learning to help this company, TAE Technologies, uh, and we're helping in two ways. We're uh, trying to optimize uh, their experiments. We're actually helping them design experiments through optimization, and we're using Bayesian methods to actually help them debug the plasma inside their machine. Oh, wow. So the, the goal is going to be trying to make this plasma about as hot as the center of the sun. And if we can do that, uh, we can measure its heat loss rate and see if we can actually get to commercially relevant fusion, which would really, I think, revolutionize the world. When, when can we expect that? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't want to promise anything. Uh, we'll have some good scientific results, I think, in 2019. We won't have what they call break-even fusion then, but we'll have some very solid results predicting the heat loss rate. So we'll know a lot more in about a year. Awesome. Cool. Yes, for me, I, I'm very excited about two things. Um, the first thing is really work, continue to work with um, the crowdsource contributors to build like really diverse, globally diverse data set, right? That not a single company couldn't build by itself, but actually leveraging everyone who's passionate about, you know, like representing their part of the world to create data set that we can open source to use by everyone. And then similarly for machine learning, since I do a lot of volunteering outside of work uh, with social entrepreneurs across the world, I really want to see that um, ML is a, available for like nonprofits, uh, you know, to do sort of air quality models or maybe like uh, Pratham books. They do like using translate to um, make books available for like thousand di different languages wow. and, and for mother tongues. So I think that's exciting. I'm looking forward to that. Nice. I think for me, there are two things I'm passionate about. One is healthcare and the other is education. And so healthcare, just this idea like you talked about, being able to use AI to do early disease detection, you have this incredible impact on one human being and on many human beings and that and on families around them and things like that. And that, that's, that I think could be really amazing. Education, I spent most of my time here at Google working on our education products. And the idea of imagining an environment where every student can learn in the way that they want to learn at their own pace, in their own style, and having AI help power that can be transformative. Uh, you can pull the potential and actually make, eat, harness the potential of every single individual in a way that was never possible before. I'm, I'm going to uh, segue from that and say, um, again, one of the things that has been really inspiring to see uh, with things like TensorFlow.js is that we have now uh, professors at a number of universities who are building educational materials around this. Um, and, and I feel like that's really important. I'm really excited about this because it, it not only lowers the barrier for entry in this technology, but it also, I think, starts to hit a much more diverse set of, of developers um, who are interested in, in, in using this technology for, for different things that we haven't even dreamt of yet. So um, I'm very excited about that. The other thing that I think is, is um, really good to see is how the conversation around machine learning has been has has started to touch on things like ethics and and fairness, and I, I think that's really important. I'm really happy that here at Google we think very deeply um, about these uh, these questions, and both from a research perspective, what are research things we can do to help address some of these problems, but also you know. Uh, policy, product-wise, design-wise, what are, it, it's, it's a broader conversation. So with that, I am going to um, thank our panel. Thank you so much. It's been so inspiring to hear not only your insights, but to have you share your experience, as I said, from many different parts of Google uh, on this topic today with us. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.